And the new kid on the block is the radio pharmaceutical, the Alpha Emitter um, Radium 223. Uh, trade name is uh, Zofigo. So, Steve, give us your experience, and especially uh, you being in the radiation oncology world. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's uh, for me, especially in the space, I, I try to uh, break it down into those patients who are asymptomatic and those patients who are symptomatic. And in the symptomatic setting, um, there was a recent FDA approval of uh, radium-223, which is now known as Zofigo. Um, so in the seminal Alsimca trial, Patients saw a significant improvement over three months to overall survival in, fa in favor of radium-223. And the way that this was given, it wasn't just given as radium-223. It was radium-223 with the best standard of care agents still being able to be give, given against the best standard of care agents. So it's not a trial of this agent. It's really a trial of whatever we were doing plus this agent. And as an agent, as a, as a radiotherapeutic agent, it's one that's actually logistically pretty uh, reasonable to give. W what happens with this agent is it has to be given by what's known as an authorized user. And that authorized user is usually a radiation oncologist or a nuclear medicine physician. And they have to go through the, the requisite training. Uh, in the current training programs in radiation oncology, Radiation oncologists are trained to do agents such as this and because they were trained to do things like samarium and strontium. So uh, the interesting thing from, from a standpoint as an IV agent, it's a little bit different, again, than a PO agent. So uh, where patients come in sometimes and they worry about you know, the co-payments of what will exist for PO agents, as an IV agent, Part B allows for hopefully lower co-payments than some of these other agents. But I think it's interesting that this agent, what it does is, if you look on the periodic table, it's two down from calcium. So it's going to go and target bone metastasis in a way that we didn't have agents before because it's an alpha emitter. And not to bore people with the, the physics, but it only give, an alpha emitter only gives off energy about 10 cell depths away from where this agent is. So you hopefully spare the toxicity of giving more broader radiation techniques. And so, again, the, the initial trial could have been powered to look at, as a primary endpoint, looking at symptoms. It was actually powered for overall survival and showed, showed an overall survival improvement. Although the secondary analysis also showed time, which they called uh, symptomatic uh, events, was actually also uh, decreased. So, they, so, you know, we're all used to SREs, mm -hmm. and now we have symptomatic skeletal events, which my understanding that the Alsimca trout was, uh, that was positive. And then also, so, you know, it's a little bit different than what we're used to, and actually it probably clinically makes more sense. And that, you know, I think the other thing people, you know, need to understand is that as a urologist that's been around for a long, long time, the radiopharmaceuticals have a lot of baggage. It goes back to phosphorus. Mm -hmm samarium and strontium and, and things like that. And as you mentioned, radium-223, Zofigo, actually only penetrates a couple cell depths and it, it results in double strain at DNA breaks because of the amount of energy that's released there. So it actually, and, and, and we were all surprised that, that was, there was a survival benefit with this. Right, I, I think for, the key thing for me is that, you know, for good or, or bad, the, some of the other things that came before it had baggage, whether it was worry about radiation going to where we didn't want it or other things or in using it in the general practice. I think using an alpha emitter in this way and prostate cancer as the model system is really going to be a game changer because in our structures as, as multidisciplinary treatment groups, most people have someone who is an authorized user, which allows for this agent to be given it's given basically once a month for six months. But we're really, it's undiscovered country in the way that we don't know, you know, is six, is six treatments the right amount? Maybe more than that may be the right amount. The, some of the issues that you d mentioned with the, how they define symptoms, and we're going to, as more work is done and more trials are done, we're going to really hone down on how we're really helping people on the palliative side. But I think this agent should not be thought of as a palliative agent. This is an agent that can give targeted radiation therapy to multiple bone masses. And I think, I, I think that's a key point. I think, you know, 
in comparison, we all know that the, the other beta, beta and gamma emitters were approved for palliative use. And they had, as you all said, carried a lot of baggage, has a lot of, had a lot of myelosuppression, had a, lot, had a bad side effect profile. I think the difference with this drug, and I think this really needs to be stressed because I think there will be a number of physicians, clinicians that will look at this and say, oh, we're just going to give this as a palliative drug. No, it is a drug that actually has a survival benefit. Bo, by the way, it also is very good for palliative well, you control. Know, the, the, the proper, I think it comes down to the proper identification of the patients. That's the bottom line, I think, that if you identify the proper patient, the drug will work effectively. The, the concern going forward for many people, I think, in the community is that, you know, the reimbursement issues, you know, it's a new drug, it's just on the block, it's just been approved. That has some concern for many people in the communities, and, and rightfully so, and I think that that's just a, a work in progress and hopefully we'll, we'll resolve it. You know, all these companies have uh, aid to, to help try to, you know, to, to navigate through that. And I, I, I think that there, because of the baggage that's associated with these, people think that these are end of the line drugs. As a matter of fact, in the Alsimka study, um, you know, uh, it was pre and post chemo and like 40 some percent of the patients uh, had not had chemo. And so that puts it in the realm of the urologist. The other thing is pain. Everybody thinks they're on morphine or things like that. And, and again, half the patients weren't. They were on just non steroidals. And had, so they weren't really patients circling the drain. And like all of these drugs, at least we're, we're starting studies right now, as they move up earlier, mm -hmm. we talked about this non metastatic castrate resistance. We just did a study called the Imagine trial with abiraterone. We're going to be starting a study with radium-223 and newly diagnosed metastatic disease uh, along with hormone therapy. And it makes sense maybe, and Dr. Quinn might want to comment on this, that radium-223 might have, I mean, might have a, a, an effect on stem cells in the marrow. Where it's, it, that's, where, that's where people fail, is that we don't eradicate these. And maybe there's some hope that that will do something. Yeah. So th this is a very interesting therapy, and I think we're going to see trials in early disease. The key, as we've said, is selecting the patients, because at the moment, if you select your patients, uh, they need to have some symptoms and, and maybe uh, some elevation of alkaline phosphatase to indicate bone activity. Now, going beyond that, we know that the bone metastases are there for a long time before the alkphos goes up and before they get pain. And the other issue here is that this is a different therapeutic. The old style strontium therapy knocked the bone marrow out. It was a real problem. Our recovery was that the treatment was sometimes worse than the, the disease for some of our patients with strontium, uh, even though it was an effective therapeutic, whereas this is actually very gentle uh, and, and does not affect the bone marrow very greatly. But the issue with the double-stranded breaks is very interesting. This is a much more effective anti-cancer therapy than strontium. Uh, because you, you only need to get one to ten hits on a cancer cell to kill it. Whereas you're talking in the thousands with, with uh, conventional sort of uh, radionuclide like a strontium. And in addition, we know that the stem cells are resistant to conventional radiation. Uh, well, there are, there are several logs more sensitive uh, in, in multiple studies. Uh, to uh, alpha particles like this. So this may be something that could make a difference. Uh, the key again is we're going to need to do really careful studies uh, to work out how to select the patients. And, and I, along the lines of selecting the patients, I think that when, when we delve, delve into the, the seminal trial, the Alsimka trial, the majority of those patients were accrued across the pond in Europe and the selection technique was using TEC-99 bone scans. Here in the United States, if you are using sodium fluoride PET, you're actually a little bit more sensitive and specific. So you're detecting patients with but probably less, maybe dis even better patients. less disease burden. And what I, I think we're, we're seeing is, um, you know, my, my partner Neil Shore uh, gave the first doses of Figo commercially in the U.S. And, and us giving the first commercial dose in Arizona. I think we're going to start seeing these patients that went from symptomatic to asymptomatic, which now resets the, the spectrum that they may be eligible for things like Provenge and some of these other things because they weren't eligible because they were right. symptomatic I, at that point. You know, I think in this space, you know, this is, the, this is always the question that comes up no matter where we discuss this, whether it's 
in a panel like this or talking to your colleagues at national meetings. The, the big question is going to be the whole sequencing of these agents, combination and sequence. And again, as, as Dr. Quinn pointed out, it's gonna, these studies are gonna have to be really well designed. But the big elephant in the room, obviously, is the cost of all these agents and you know what this looks so, like. So, so it's a work in progress. I mean, we're we're at the tip of the iceberg, if you will, you know. And I think this is going to evolve into a, a whole subspecialty within our specialty in some ways. I mean, this group of patients for many many years was, you know, we didn't have a lot of options. You know, when if you think back 20 years ago when all of us were residents or 30 years ago. Um, you know, patients that had metastatic disease, we would give them hormones and then we'd ship them off to the oncologist. And I think we're seeing this shift in the treatment modalities that now we're able to retain these patients, offer them treatments that actually may be successful and actually have some response to them. Whether it's, you know, immunotherapy to, to you know, radium-223 or, you know, the, the new drugs that are out all of them offer, you know, potential hope for all our patients. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the concept of making this a chronic disease is, is kind of where we're heading, but we also fully realize that we have to have a better marker to be able to follow these patients as opposed to doing studies where the end point is overall survival because it's just those studies are going to take well, you know, too I long. I think we're, we're one of the things that we're, you know, we got to think beyond is that, that you know we're, every, we're talking about and I give these talks all the time on sequencing and maybe you start out with the least toxic and you get it go to the most toxic and things like that but when you think about we, we have seven new drugs that have been approved in the past uh, four years and they're all different which is great like you mentioned we have new we have a new whole new arena to, a whole bunch of toys we can play with so to speak but in every cancer that we cure it's not monotherapy, and, and Hodgkin's disease is four drugs, and testis cancer is three drugs, and leukemia is lymphomas, other things like that. So we really, and there's a, there's a rationale to, to getting things like Provengen early, radium-223, combining Zytiga um, with uh, enzalutamide and, and all that. And then we go, oh my God, this is gonna cost a fortune. Well, I mean, we gotta, we'll figure that out. Uh, and maybe, and, and this sounds a little bit crazy, is that it's not going to be long-term therapy. Like we don't c continue chemotherapy for five years. We do it for like three or four months, and then we stop. So if you threw everything at these people, what might happen? Now the medical oncologists don't get very excited about that. They, but maybe David has a different feeling. But I think it's got it. You've got to go down that path of putting these things together if we're going to move forward. Otherwise, we're just going to be playing the sequencing game, which is fun, but, and we probably will improve survival rate. But we've also improved survival rate in metastatic prostate cancer. If you look at the current intermittent trial versus the one we did years before, and it wasn't just lead time bias, but in the same people, we have a lot of other things going on, better medical care and things like that. So we're going to take a step forward where we really need to take a step forward. I just want to make a point about the urologist role in all this. It, it's, it's very simple for the urologist to educate themselves, you know, whether it's themselves or choose a physician champion within the practice, the delivery of all these therapies is, is also very easy. For example, we have you know, over 20 offices in the metro Atlanta area and take something as what appears to be complicated as radium-223. There's no licensed urologist in our practice that can actually administer the therapy, but we, depending on where, which office the patient is in, what hospital, it's going to be either the radiation therapist or the nuclear medicine physician in the hospital. So it's going to vary from from office to office, and I think urologists still need to continue to manage these patients and care for them and, and be the lead physician uh, for the advanced prostate cancer patient. So and let's, I, go ahead, Steve. So on, on one last thing on that. When you look at, let's say, the abiraterone pre-chemo uh, Cougar 302 study, survival curves don't separate for about 15 months, which may represent some small segment of patients that don't respond to abiraterone, but what to me it says is a lot of these men actually are dying of things other than prostate cancer. That for some of these men, we've succeeded and we've taken their metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer and made it a chronic disease, in which case we need to be thinking holistic and the impact of these drugs, their side effects, the metabolic side effects, not just the hormones, but in the late stage, continuing to be their doctors, making sure they're exercising, eating right, avoiding some of the weight gain, the fatigue that we're seeing, the metabolic sequelae, you know, still be doctors at the end of the day. So let's talk a little bit.